Hello, everyone. I believe it's past two o'clock now, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, first off, thank you for taking the time to join us in our GibbsCam 2024 What's New webinar. Uh, my name is Bruce King. I'm a senior application engineer at GibbsCam, and I'm also manage the application engineer and technical support team. Uh, I understand your time is valuable, so the goal today is to highlight many of the new features in 2024 without going into too many details. Um, and we'll try to keep the time down. Um, <clears throat> and just a couple notes before we get started. So uh, attendees should automatically be muted and cameras off so you won't shouldn't have to be concerned with that. Um, anytime during the presentation, if uh, a question should arise, please feel free to type these questions into the chat area at any time. Uh, you won't you won't be disturbing the presentation. And then at the end, as time allows, we'll try to review some of those and answer them for you. And also, this session will be recorded. OK, so I'm going to turn my camera off. So you can look at the full presentation screen and we're going to get started. So here is just a um, snapshot of uh, many of the features we'd like to cover today. Um, as you can see, it's a, a pretty large list. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started. All right, to start, we'll start with enhancements we are going to put in the general category so these are not lathe specific or mill specific but uh, just general interface and other parts of the software uh, things that just make gibbs cam easier to use the first one is licensing so um, you may be aware of some issues we've had in the past and and caused by our sim lm sim lm licensing system so uh, that has now been replaced by Reprise, uh, one that we've used in the past. Um, so not only should that, um, you know, make it easier to use and uh, less trouble, less support, but it opens the door for new things we can do with licensing in the future. So expect to see new things in uh, versions to come. And this, this is the start of that, uh, switching over to Reprise. All right. Uh, post configuration tab. Uh, this is new. Uh, so this does depend on the post having this set up. Um, so it's additional tab in the post processor dialog. Um, and we just took a little snippet here of a sample post. Um, things you could do with it. Um, toggle support TCP on and off, for instance, uh, before you post or rotary clamping or anything you want to toggle each time you post and you want to have control over you could do that or you can make a pull down choice like here we've shown arc formats our format or ijk um, <clears throat> so this is basically um, customizable for you um, it does require a post change so you'd have to contact the uh, post department for that or contact your reseller Another enhancement here is in the work fixtures editor. So we've added a, you'll see the button restrict work fixture offsets. So in this particular case, we have a list of usable offsets on the left and on the right, we've specified three that we want to restrict. So in other words, they cannot be used uh, in this editor and in this program. So you've basically protected them from use. Um, a couple of uh, visualization, we'll call them enhancements. Um, first one is visual, visual edge selection. So um, this is a nice feature. I, I think I keep this on by default. Um, so edges that are behind the solid or sheet body are hidden uh, that way. So on a complex model, if you look at the uh, graphic on the left, you'll notice you see all the edges even behind your view. 
the more complex the model, this gets kind of busy and hard to look at. <clears throat> so on the right is with visible edge selection active. You see, it's much cleaner, much easier to look at. So this is a great new feature. Another one is virtual points, view and interrogate. So uh, we can display and use now what we're calling virtual points um, based on model edges. And we can basically snap off of those points such as endpoints, midpoints, center points, et cetera. So uh, let's take a look at that real quick. So the first thing is edges do need to be turned on. For dimensioning, there's really nothing you need to do. Just simply hover over an edge in the area you're hovering over, you'll see the available points. Okay, so for things like geometry creation, solids creation, <clears throat> You will need to hold down the Alt key to make these active. And then you can use the normal interrogation uh, Alt Shift like you're used to. But here you can do this without extracting the geometry, without extracting points. You can get it directly off the model. Okay, so that's virtual points, another new addition to 2024. Another useful visualization tool that is new is uh, color mapping of curvature and of taper or draft angles. So these are two new options. Um, they're with all the other color modes that you're used to, um, and their solids and surface will display with corresponding color palettes, and it's Best explained if we take a look at it. All right, so again, in the color mode, pull down like you're used to, there's two options that are new, taper angle and curvature color. Start with taper. So you notice <clears throat> all the faces displayed in the various colors. Um, based on the amount of draft they have. You can real time hover over faces and get feedback of what the taper angle is. You can choose whether you want it just to be an absolute or plus or minus value. You can also edit the color palette. So you can change the colors. You can insert colors. That way you have more ranges. You can also move the colors around, shift them up or down. And if you want to revert back to the original, you can always reset to the defaults. Here we're showing curvature. So any face with curvature will show. Again, you can hover over to get feedback. You can do minimum curvature. This would be useful for um, what size tool you should use. You can display max curvature and the mean curvature. And as with taper angle, you can also edit the color palette. All right, so real useful tools here added in Gibbs Cam 2024. <clears throat> All right, another big enhancement for us is the integration of the Sandvik Cora Plus tool library. So this will transfer the cutting tools from the Cora Plus library into the Gibbs Cam. Um, so to, to pull in the tool assemblies and it will also bring in any corresponding cutting data will come along with it. Uh, just a note here, you must have a valid and active um, Cora Plus tool library account and of course have some tool data in there to be able to uh, transfer in. Uh, so you do have to have a, an active 
uh, account with Sandvik to run the Coral Plus library. So we'll give you an example of what this looks like. So you can either use uh, directly from the uh, plugins, you can launch it, or here we're launching it from a process. It'll bring up your library in Coral Plus. Here we're selecting a prime turning B type insert, an assembly that was already created. Take a look at the tool. And we'll go ahead and add another one. So this is another prime turning, the A type insert. Okay, so this is how you transfer tool assemblies from the Coral Plus tool library into GibbsCam. <clears throat> All right, fees and speeds associated with tools, and this is slightly associated with what we uh, just, just looked at. Um, so we now um, optionally allow you to use fees and speeds assigned to tools instead of what was in the process. So, um, uh, there's kind of two schools of thought here, you know, feeds and speeds belong with tools, feeds and speeds belong with processes. Both can be true depending on your use for them. So we allow for both. Uh, so we now allow it with the tool. And this is especially useful because if we're going to have that data in a library such as Coral Plus, then we might as well make use of that data and allow it to come over. So that's what we're doing now. So we'll take a look at that real quick. So you notice this cutting data button and there is a blue check mark. So if you see a blue check mark, that means there is the cutting data is present. So you can get in there and edit. You can also add additional as many as you want. You can name them whatever you want. Um, so basically make your own your own data set. Right, so if we look at these processes, well, you'll notice there is a tool button now. And if you see a blue check mark, that means it does have tool data. So you're using a tool with it. You can choose which set of data you want to use. Click on calc speed, calc feed. It'll update the process. And now you're using the, the tool data. Okay, and this also applies to milling processes. Okay. Now we'll look at uh, enhancements to save process. So in the past, uh, loading a process, um, a save process. Sometimes the CS field was ignored. Um, so now we're not ignoring it. We're trying to load it with the correct one from the saved process. Um, so this was sometimes a problem in certain uh, circumstances. So uh, this should be improved now. So now we'll just see that if we load a process, So we'll load a process from a list. So you can see the CS is properly set.
and here we'll, for instance, grab a, a face pocket. So you can see the correct XY plane, the correct CS was loaded. So now when loading processes, the correct CS should be assigned. Okay, another improvement and new functionality is within intermediate tooling fixtures. So what we're calling fixture stacking. So just like you can do now with tool blocks, uh, you know, put tool blocks together, we can now do this with uh, fixtures. So we can put fixture components together. They have a receptor and an attachment point. Um, so now we're allowed to stack the fixtures uh, for multiple part stations, um, fixtures can now reorient and reposition the part or other fixtures. So if you put a fixture on a fixture, it can reorient or a part in something that's got a different orientation, the part will follow along. So we'll take a look at that. So this is for a turning environment. We'll grab a faceplate. In here, we're going to attach a face driver. So now you can orient it correctly, basically making an assembly here, a fixture assembly. And for the sub, we'll Put another plate in. And to the plate, we'll attach a live center. Now when we run machine sim, you can see our fixtures included. Okay, and then we also have a milling example. So here we'll grab a Kurt vise. We can check, uh, set the jaw opening. And place the part into it. Now we'll also add an angle plate. We can position it. We can also set its angle. And here we're going to add, attach another vise to it. And of course, we can place the part in it. And this also allows you to keep fixtures, even if you're not using them, but they would be mounted and machined at that time. You can leave them on and still run them in SIM and collision check. Okay, so that's fixture stacking. Another new item is rotary alignment and generic probing. So now we can probe on a rotary part. So if we have faces, for example, to probe, uh, that either to set a work offset or to measure the part, um, we can now support multi axis, four and five axis. So we'll take a quick look at that. So 
now you see rotary axis and probing. We'll pick a probe. And we can do measurement or work fixture offset. So we pick a point on the face and then give it the distance between points to probe at. And here we're doing one that involves a tilt angle also. Now the probing will involve the rotary and tilt axes as needed. OK, so that's rotary alignment and probing. All right, so now we'll look at a few turning specific enhancements. This first one is a mill cutoff um, from MTM. Uh, you will find this with the mill processes, um, but obviously this would be used uh, in turning. So you can perform cutoffs with a milling tool, uh, like an end mill if you want to be perpendicular to work, or a side milling like, like a slitting saw uh, to do parallel to work. There's our new mill cutoff process. We'll choose the tool. So you can choose your cutting style and then the strategy. So we have continuous spiral, a single cut, two cuts in the same direction, and two cuts back and forth. And we'll take a look at some examples. So this is a continuous spiral with an end mill. Now we have a single cut with an end mill. And this is two cuts same direction and two cuts back and forth. Now we're using a saw. There's two cuts. Two back and forth. And this is a continuous spiral. OK, so that's mill cutoff. Uh, another improvement is uh, we've added support for the second generation B-type insert for prime turning from Sandvik. So, this second gen insert, the B type, is a little bit larger than the Gen 1. Um, and they've also added a, uh, an additional tool nose radius of 1.6 millimeter. So this larger insert is going to allow you to get a little more aggressive. And of course, we automatically, when you choose this insert, will put the correct max depth of cuts and related specs in the uh, prime turning process automatically. So here you see the min max depth of cut based on the insert you're using. So no change really as far as prime turning, it's just that this insert is now not only supported, but you're able to set up a tool using that insert. All right, now we'll look at some milling enhancements. Uh, we've made some improvements to how we handle form tools. So we've handled form tools for many years, both in solid and, and just a uh, revolved geometry. Um, <clears throat> so 
current now in 2024, you'll see in the tool dialog a choice for real profile, monotonic, or nominal. So real profile is default behavior that you've been used to for years. There's no change there. Uh, but monotonic profile basically disables undercut portions of the tool. So if you look at the graphic below it, you can see that diameter D2. If we go to monotonic, it will basically go away. Um, you will also see the little graphic symbol of your tool will now have a, a, a like a purple halo around it showing you what the shape actually will be that Kibscan will be using. Um, and this can be probably more useful for uh, if you import a solid of a, let's say, a relieved shank uh, tool, and you don't want the, the shank to be involved in cutting. You don't want it to move the tool over into the part tool far, far and try to use that shank as a um, cutting feature. So if you choose the monotonic, you'll eliminate that problem. With the third choice, nominal parameters is uh, real useful. Uh, many times when you import a solid tool for like a um, multi-insert cutter, face mill, what have you, um, the manufacturer in the specs will give you what the nominal diameter is when that tool assembly is all put together and then what the virtual corner radius is. And that's really all we need to perform our um, process calculations. So in this case, instead of, you know, it, it looking at the entire assembly from top to bottom, you simply put the nominal diameter in and the virtual corner radius, and that's all we need to generate toolpath. Now the complete tool uh, of the solid model will be shown in simulation like you want it to. Um, but for actually definition, this is an easier and probably more accurate way to define it. Another improvement is to the contour material only when used with pocketing. Um, so there's no user interface changes here. Uh, this applies when you've got a contour and pocketing process in the same tile list and both processes are using material only. So you notice in this example on the left, Gibbscam 2023, the toolpath it produced, and you'll see there was quite a bit of air cut there on that gap. It doesn't really recognize that gap. By simply opening this part in Gibbscam 24 and doing a redo, you'll see the change in the toolpath. It recognizes that gap and uh, does a, a rapid move over it. Another change is the ramp down contour improvements. Again, no user interface changes. Um, the problem was there in the left, and I think this is mostly when you selected faces um, to be machined, then it would do the ramp, but each full rotation around, it would lead out, lead back in again, and lead out, which is not the desired toolpath you want. So you look on the right, Gibbscam 2024, it's one continuous ramp like you would expect. So that's been improved for 2024. Another interesting enhancement, uh, a new process uh, within the contour is engraving. So this is variable depth engraving of outline font. So uh, there, there's so many fonts out there to use, but all of the almost all of these true type fonts by default are outline fonts. And we know when we just do a normal contour and outline font, you normally don't get the best results like you're really looking for. You kind of want it to be more like a stick font, but you want to be able to kind of cut in between the outlines. So you want it like to be a wide stick font with good edges, sharp edges. So uh, this is best used with a taper tool and make sure the tool diameter is larger than the stroke width of the font. So we'll take a look at how that's done. All 
All right, so here we have a process um, using a normal contour process. So you see it's set to offset contour. Uh, I had to mess around with the stock allowance and with the depth. And then you finally get something that's acceptable. Now we'll look at a, an engraving. So it's still under the contour, but we have offset contour and added engraving. Here I just give it a depth. And you'll notice it's quite different. Uh, it's good in the sharp corners. It knows to lift the tool up. And here we see side by side difference between the two. So the part I just showed you on the left is just using offset contour. On the right is using the new engraving. Uh, so you can see it, it's definitely an improvement. OK, user controls for orientations at singularity. So um, whenever you have a machine with a rotary and your tool is axis is basically going to be parallel to that rotary for doing like three axis type of work, um, you're always going to be in what we call a singularity condition. And we've had in the past, we, we have preset rules. Some are different for a five axis process. Some are different for polar. Um, um, they kind of have different rules and when they work, it's fine, but there's times when they don't give you what you want and we have never really given you control over that. There's sometimes workarounds that can get frustrating. Well, now we've taken care of all that and made it very simple to get what you need. So this is most useful for when I see you know, support cases and all come in. It's mostly, hey, my, I've got a big part of a machine and it's, it's going over the Y axis or even X axis. It's just over traveling. And I know I can look at, it, I can see if I can just put the, park the tool in this position and then rotate from there, I'm good. But I can't get there from here. So now we've given you the tools to do that. Um, so the options that we have are do not rotate automatic rotary axis angle and align with. And you won't see all of these in all of the different process types. Uh, I've got them noted there, uh, but just be aware of that. If, if those changes you use them, that's that's expected behavior. So let's take a look uh, at a part. So this part um, is on a rotary. The Z axis, the tool axis is parallel to the rotary. There's three operations here. This whole op doesn't give us a problem. This one does, you notice the red, so that's uh, over traveling the whole time. This third op, it is in and out of over travel as it goes out to the OD. So ops two and three are a problem. We cannot run those, so we do need to fix this. Op one is not a problem, but let's just use an example that, hey, we don't like the tool over on that side of the part. We have reasons why we want that tool to run in a different place on that part. So what we can do is go to the rotary axis angle setting and just give it an amount. We want to basically rotate it from where it was starting in automatic and force it to go to a different position. So now when we take a look at this, Notice the tool now is basically parked on the opposite side of this part. So again, the idea is we now have control over this. Now let's look at this one. It's over traveling an X for the whole duration of the operation. So now we need to get this in a spot where it will not over travel. So the way we'll work with this one is assign a alignment vector. Now these alignment vectors are not available by default. They have to be set up in the MDD, and this is just a quick look at where it would be set up in Machine Manager. 
So I added two of them here, a quadrant one at 45 degrees and quadrant two at 135, just as examples. So we'll use the quadrant one, redo, and take a look. And now you see that's in a position that it's not going to over travel on X or Y. And we can basically do the same thing. This is a five axis process, but it's actually uh, set to three axis. And we'll just use the second one to just do it differently. And again, now it's in a position that it can get all the way around that part without any of the linear axis in an over travel condition. So this just makes it very simple. Uh, things that were very difficult before. Um, this is just so much easier. So this is a great improvement. All right, so we're nearing the end here, so I'm just going to do some mentions of some five axis improvements. Uh, for rotary machining, uh, some new slice options for finishing. So optimize step over for walls. So if you're trying to do more with the walls versus the floor, there's some more options that to make a better tool path, more specific to the what we would call the walls. And then the second one would be for more for, for, for floor finishing, um, either cylindrical or conical. You can specify a, a conical angle. Uh, obviously, you need a five axis machine for that. So if you did want to finish a conical portion of like a feed screw um, and want to use the fifth axis to lock that in position to do that, uh, you'd be able to do that with this. All right. Um, in our normal five axis uh, surface pass, the uh, if you're familiar using the five axis, all the other strategies, you have the run tool, auto at center, et cetera, and you did not have that available for the project uh, strategy. So now we do. So that gives you a little more flexibility with that. Uh, also in surface passes um, and surfaces is the user defined tool orientation on the lead in and lead out. So you can now actually define a vector that you want to put the tool in during the lead in the lead out move, and that's a user defined direction. And then uh, a simple little change here to linked entry exit feed distances. Normally your entry and exit are the same, and but they've always been two fields. So if you often just keep those the same, uh, there's a little setting here just to equal the exit to the entry. So you're only changing one value. Okay, and deburring, um, there's been some, you know, general improvements, but uh, one thing to be aware of if you use the deburring in five axis is the selection is going to be a little bit different. Um, um, in previous versions, uh, you chose auto detect or user define. Well, now auto detect is kind of understood. Um, so it runs in auto detect mode, but down now if your results are that you want to exclude some of the edges or you want to include only specific edges, then you can choose both include and exclude curve sets and, and that will give you more control. Uh, but it's just a little different way of defining it. So we just have to be aware of that. Okay, in multi-axis machining, you can align the tool with the 3D containment um, so now you can choose whether you want to stay in or out. Uh, we've added point distribution. Uh, there's ramp offset for roughing, which is basically on your first depth cut. If you're ramping in air too much, you can basically trim that off. Uh, you can also choose the floor boundary that you, if whatever floor you've selected, that'll become the boundary is 3D containment. You don't have to pull the curve out of there. Um, user defined start point for finishing and also tilt tool during helix. So if it's doing a helix move ramp down into the part, um, this mode allows you to also have it look at the floor, for example, and, and stay normal to the floor. So it will be tilting. Um, it just be a, a better way to get in the part, uh, depending on your part. 
Okay, in geodesic, uh, this is our final one. So straighten cuts on boundaries. If you look at the graphic on the right, you'll see sometimes the edges get a little dirty on this toolpath and it's just not doing a great job of lining up. And so there's a straighten cut on boundaries option here that'll help improve that. And then finally, improved hole filling. So if you have a portion that you do want to fill a toolpath, um, that um, that just process of doing that has been improved, so you should see better results. Okay, and that's all I have. So I believe now if Vic will join me, um, we should be able to take some questions. Hey, Bruce, great job. Thanks a lot. A lot of great new features in 2024. I hope everybody appreciated that. Yeah, we don't have as many as uh, this morning's session, but we have a couple for you, Bruce. Um, do virtual points populate five axis dialog fields and all plugins? That's a good one. Have I, I tried that? Try I, some of that? Yeah, I think they should. Um, but now I don't, honestly, I don't remember if I've tried that or not. Um, but they, they should, so I'll have to look at that. Okay. Um, a comment from Alex, fixture st stacking is a great addition to the software. A question from, um, uh, how do you get those colors in the rendering? And I wasn't sure what he meant there. Andy's kind of uh, partly answered if he was talking about the fixture colors, which was a Yeah, question. we were asked that in the first session. So I, I think this didn't work in 23. Maybe this was the problem and it was supposed to, and it does work in 24. So. The bottom line is when you set up the VNC files that you use to define your fixtures and assign them as intermediate tooling, you can just um, just make sure you're in the user color mode when you save that, and then that should pass through. So when you run simulation, they'll show their colors. Okay, uh, there's an answer coming from somebody I've populated field using alt and virtual points before. Um, someone asked about that previously. Uh, long question here. Custom end mill tool holders. Gibscam has preloaded tool holders that are available in the drop down. Currently, I have to either import in a 3D model to 2D geometry supplied from the holder manufacturers and apply the tool holder to the tool to ensure that everything is going here to clear. Is there a way to let users add in their own tool holders to the drop down menu and name them accordingly? Oh, yes. Well, this has been asked more than once, let's say. So the answer is no right now. So what, okay. what they want to do is the drop downs that that we um, can select, you know, all right, so you got a set of cat 40 holders and now you're going to go through your list and see them change. They want to add to that list their own custom tool holders. Got it. So. Okay. Unfortunately, the answer is no for now, but um, that's not the first time that's been asked. So we'll, we'll bring it up in the next um, feature session. Mm -hmm. okay, sounds good. Um, I'm using Gibbscan to make a program for big horizontal boring machines. The machine primarily uses a boring spindle, but sometimes I have to put on an automatic head from a pickup station. The head is a machine accessory. The machine has a tool changer of 60 positions. I can use the same tool to work in the spindle and in the milling head. Question, do I have to create 60 tools for spindle and another 60 same tools for milling head in Gibbscan? Hmm. I think we'd have to get a specific example, look at that, because a lot of that I think can be done with intermediate tooling. So we'll have to, we'd have to take a look. All right. We will get back to you on that, sir. Um, okay, uh, the guy that asked about the colors is, I think he's happy with his explanation. And thanks guys. Yeah, great job, Bruce. I think we're clear to go. Thank you, sir. Appreciate everybody's time today. Thanks for joining the session. We hope you enjoy using 2024. All right, thank you everyone. Have a good day. Thank you, bye.